Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me and thank you all of you for your patience. I'm quite aware I'm between you and coffee, but I'll still try to uh, share a few uh, recent findings that we had on the P53 MDM2 regulatory system that is uh, displayed here. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two aspects that are fairly novel about it, and that is that this system um, is both capable of modifying chromatin and of controlling DNA replication. So that's what my talk is going to be all about. Now, P53, you had some introduction to P53, and uh, if not, you had P53 at school, I'm sure, uh, because nowadays, I mean, P53 is known to be the most successful tumor suppressor, and that's based on the fact that it is found mutant in about 50%, if not more, of all human cancers as the patients come into the, to the clinics. So nothing will beat P53 for that. It's by far the most uh, commonly mutated uh, uh, tumor suppressor a gene or any gene uh, in human cancer, and that's uh, probably causing uh, P53 to even make it into the popular literature. So you can read this while lying in bed or sitting in the bathroom or whatever you're doing uh, while reading. So uh, P53 is a topic that uh, is important for many people, uh, most uh, of the, either working on cancer or having cancer. Uh, so what is P53 doing? P53 is a transcription factor, and the way it works is outlined here. It comes as a tetramer, being held together through those carboxy-terminal uh, oligomerization domain. This will allow P53 to interact with a specific site on promoters, on the DNA, there's a consensus element depicted down here, bound by all four members of such a tetramer, and this in turn then will enable the uh, amino terminal transactivation domains uh, to tether the initiation factors of transcription, like you know TF2D, like histone acetyl transferases, to the vicinity of such promoters, thereby. Uh, inducing uh, the activity and the expression of the adjacent gene. That's what P53 is doing. However, uh, it has to be controlled, it has to be uh, turned on only under specific circumstances, and that's most notably when genotoxic stress occurs, when the DNA is damaged, then a set of kinases, you may have heard of ATM, ATR, check one, check two, is being induced. Those kinases will phosphorylate P53, this essentially will activate its um, it will activate uh, the molecule as a transcription factor, and depending a bit on the degree of how strong it's being activated, you either induce a set of genes that will mediate cell cycle arrest, okay, no more S phase here, cell cycle arrest, or otherwise, if we are facing strong genotoxicity, uh, the, the uh, P53 will be activated to the point where it uh, increases the expression of pro-apoptotic proteins called Puma noxa. Bugs, you know, those uh, pro-apoptotic ones uh, that will then mediate apoptosis seen here by the subject on shoulder. So that's what P53 is doing. Now, in cancer cells, as I said, you find about 50% uh, of uh, mutant uh, P53, and then we just had this in the cholangiocarcinoma, uh, uh, um, that uh, typically within the DNA binding uh, domain, P53 is mutant, so it can no longer interact with the DNA. You can ask what will happen in the, uh, in, in the absence of such a mutation when wild type P53 is still around. Well, then what you get is what we like to call dormant P53, meaning that it's wild type, yes, but it's inactivated to the point that it's just uh, no longer relevant for suppressing uh, the tumor. And believe it or not, some years ago, Giovanni Blandino, my friend who is sitting here in the audience, has been heading a big time European consortium uh, with like uh, 20 groups all over Europe just working on this process, how P53 is being kept dormant and how you can deliver a wake-up call to it. And uh, the way you deliver a wake-up call to it is by analyzing and, uh, and manipulating the regulatory network that is governing P53 activity and um, most notably a molecule called MDM2. 
is providing negative feedback on P53. That's at the center of the uh, P53 regulatory network. P53 induces MDM2 as part of its uh, transcriptional activation program, but MDM2 will physically associate with P53 as a protein, and it will also mediate the ubiquitination of P53. So MDM2 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase, um, and it will thereby ubiquitinate and destabilize P53 because that's, that ubiquitinated P53 then goes to the trash can, it goes to the proteasome in the cell. So that's the control mechanism at the center. And now you can tip the balance. You can either inactivate MDM2 or you can activate P53 or the other way around, depending on whether you want more active or less active P53. So that's uh, being achieved through the, uh, through the DNA damage uh, response, which will tend to lead to P53 activation. Um, but we have different means, like oncogene-driven means, to uh, inhibit MDM2, which will then also in, uh, induce P53. And as a result, the induction of target genes by P53 will either lead to cell cycle arrest or to apoptosis, depending on the degree of activation. All right. So our lab over the past decade has uh, made a few uh, contributions to understanding this system in a bit more detail. We started with the subnuclear localization of MDM2. We continued with the impact of microRNAs on P53 or on the activity of P53. And uh, more recently, uh, we were also working on the homologs of P53 that all of us happen to have in our cells. Um, and now, most recently, we have been trying to elucidate the connection between replication stress or replicative stress and P53, essentially finding out that P53 has a protective role in a situation of replicative stress in a cell. That's what I would like to go into a bit more detail with you now. now what I told you is that uh, cancer cells have very frequently have, a, have lost their P53 function, one way or another, by mutation or by inactivation. And what I'm going to tell you is that another frequent trait of cancer cells is the accumulation of DNA damage, just on their own. You know, you don't have to feed the patient with chemotherapy for that. The cancer cells as such will already accumulate DNA damage. And at least one important way of how we think it happens is that these cells are having trouble replicating their DNA, that their DNA polymerases while going through the genome will stumble, will stop, will collapse, and uh, thereby confer DNA damage uh, to, the, to the cell as it's trying to replicate its DNA. So how do we know that? I just uh, put the first piece of evidence for that. Um, this, is, um, this is just plain human cancer cells. In this case, uh, taken from a, from a breast carcinoma. This is also from, from Copenhagen, by the way. Um, so your friends uh, did this at the, the Danish Cancer Society. And uh, they, uh, what they found was that even without having to treat the cells, uh, and even without uh, having to wait, wait very long, even early onset cancer uh, will contain damage DNA damage, and then these are hallmarks of DNA damage. All of that is essentially phosphorylations. Here we are again, Maya. Phosphorylations of um, of uh, diff diverse uh, substrates that indicate a DNA damage response. So we find that constitutively in most human cancers, they are undergoing DNA damage, and we think it's because they are undergoing replicative stress. Now, if that's true. If this is, these are two frequent traits of cancer cells, could it be that they are causally connected? Could it be that P53 has an impact on replicative stress? And again, I wouldn't ask that question if I wouldn't have some answer to it. And uh, so, um, so here is uh, the lady who was working on, uh, on this, Ina Klusman, uh, recently. But she has been asking, in a similar way, the following. What we think we know, the way we put it in the textbooks, is that replicative stress will lead to DNA damage, DNA damage will lead to DNA damage signaling, this will phosphorylate, activate P53, and this will induce apoptosis. And based on this mechanism, P53 has been dubbed the guardian of the genome. But I mean, give me a break. 
what kind of a guardian is that? A guardian that will see his master under attack and then go ahead and then stab a knife into the, his master. Uh, I mean, that's not, not, you wouldn't hire this kind of a guardian, right? So, uh, no, would I. So, so what Ina has been asking, well, maybe there is a more constructive way about how P53 will act. She asked if P53 might be acting not just to eliminate cells that are undergoing replicative stress, but to actually reduce replicative stress. Maybe P53 has some means uh, to make DNA replication more smooth, no, pro more processive. And uh, that's what she has been uh, trying. And the, the key uh, technology that she has been using for that is a uh, DNA fiber assay. That is, um, you, you follow single DNA replication forms by feeding the cells with a fluorescent label so, well, actually a label that you can later on stain in a fluorescent manner, just to be precise about that. So you label the DNA as it's being replicated in a cell. And subsequently you spread the DNA on a glass slide and stain the label with fluorescent antibodies. So in this way you can follow single replication forks. You know, this is just a piece of DNA that has been synthesized during the past, uh, say, 30 minutes or one hour, and that the cells have been incubated first with the red label and then with the green label. And so in this way you can, you can actually measure how long this is, and it will tell you how quickly this DNA replication fork has been moving forward. So we can follow each and every replication fork um, that we have in a cell. And now after an industrial graduate student spends a couple of hundred hours, you can make statistics out of these, um, out of these uh, fibers and assay for the general speed of replication fork progression in each system that you're interested in. So we did this on murine embryonic fibroblasts that we had derived uh, from, um, from mice that carry a phlox copy of P53. That's a, that's a conditional knockout, a way that you can at will just take out P53 from that cell population. And we did this both with and without the removal of P53. And what we do as soon as we see, we remove P53, we see that these replication forks are moving along a lot more slowly than in the presence of wild type P53. And when, if, we, if we treat the cells with a chemotherapeutic agent that imposes replicative stress on cells, this is gemcitabine in this case, um, we see essentially the same thing. Gemcitabine does reduce replication of fork speed, I hope so, otherwise it wouldn't be working at all. Um, uh, but if we do this in the absence of P53, we again get less for progression, so the cell is having more trouble to replicate its DNA. Now, we see this, we looked at the same thing in thymocytes. Why thymocytes? Well, that's because in a P53 knockout mouse, the thymocytes are the first cells to become malignant to form tumors in these animals. So we were particularly interested in those cells. Are they perhaps suffering replicative stress? And uh, again, the answer was yes, this is now untreated cells. This is the wild type situation, this is the heterozygotes, and this is the homozygous P53 knockout. And as you see, if you compare the first and the, and the last panel, uh, you can uh, still appreciate that there is a reduction in this uh, DNA replication fork progression. So again, in the absence of P53, you are suffering replicative stress. Now, how would it work? How would P53 support uh, DNA replication? That was the obvious next question. And since I told you P53 is a, rep is a transcription factor, what could have been more obvious than asking, okay, which target gene, which target gene of P53 might be responsible for its impact on DNA replication. So we did a few guesses. I don't show you all of that. I just show you the one that worked. And uh, so the, where we think we have been guessing right uh, was MDM2. MDM2, I told you, is a, is a P53 responsive gene. It provides that negative feedback loop. But we, we didn't want to see the feedback loop in this case. So we did it all in systems that lack P53 altogether. So we start with the P53 null situation, no P53. And the difference between the system is now just whether or not we knock down MDM2. And if we take MDM2 from a P53 null cell line, again, we lose DNA replication for processivity. Same thing in the presence of gemcitabine. 
And if we tried this in a genetically defined model system in mice where we either take out P53 alone or P53 and MDM2 together, what we see again is that the replication for, uh, progression decreases as we are taking out MDM2. So that makes us believe that MDM2 is at least part of the explanation that it will, when induced by P53, provide the cell with the capability of replicating its DNA properly. So that's the, the final uh, model from, from that part. Um, in different systems that we have been looking at, P53 is supporting DNA replication for processivity, and so does MDM2. And since P53 is activating the expression levels of, uh, of MDM2, we think that this loop is at least part of the explanation of how P53 um, will enhance DNA replication processivity. So in other words, P53 can be good for you if you're a cell. It's not just such a killer that will eliminate cells. It can improve the replication processivity. So if that's true, how helpful is it then to activate P53 for cancer therapy? Huh? Maybe not. Um, uh, but that's an important question because people since, uh, you may be aware of this, here is industry people sitting here, so you may have known the, the, um, the activities by the company Roche, most, uh, most notably. Roche ha was uh, the first to, to develop an inhibitor of MDM2, which goes right for this, um, for this uh, P53 binding domain on MDM2. There's a greasy pocket that you can fill with the drug, and they were so incredibly proud of this drug that they called it after after their headquarters in Nutley, New Jersey. So um, that's why they call the drug Nutlin. No joke, it's true. So, so the drug Nutlin will fit right where normally P53 would fit in, and it will push off P53 from MDM2. And uh, so it, it looked beautiful, you know? We can now reactivate the most successful tumor suppressor uh, that you would know of. But, uh, you know, <laughs> These are the, the, this is from, from clinicaltrials.gov, and this is not the only one. There are now a few, quite, a few, you know, quite a few companies jumping on this. You, know, you can have a drug from Novartis, another one from Sanofi, another one from, uh, from Roche. You can have several. They all now went to, to, to clinical trials, and no study results posted. This was from two or 2010. Doesn't look good, right? And you, you know, they, they wouldn't really present this on the net, but if you talk to people on, uh, on meetings, um, they're not too enthusiastic about it, uh, about the use of, uh, of MDM2 inhibitors, this kind of inhibitors, I should say, uh, in the clinics. But you know, wait a minute, um, maybe we just wouldn't get it right. If, if, if you do that, if you, if you treat cells with nutling uh, to, to antagonize the interaction between MDM2 and P53, yes, you will activate P53, and probably, not only probably, you do induce cell death in quite a proportion, depending on the kind of cells you are subjecting to that, but you do induce apoptosis in a proportion of cells. Um, however, you are obviously improving DNA replication in a different set of cells, and uh, we have tried this on Nutlin, I just don't, don't show you the data here, but, uh, but Nutlin definitely improves DNA replication. So maybe we are helping at least a portion of the cells to survive. That's not really what you want if you're treating cancer. So, uh, but maybe we are just not really getting it right. Maybe we shouldn't be just inclusively inhibiting this P53 binding site on MDM2. Maybe we need to go for different sites on MDM2 that are responsible for this mechanism that will enable MDM2 to have smooth uh, DNA replication. So, for instance, this ring finger domain that is, uh, that is uh, the, the E3 ubiquitin ligase domain on, on MDM2, maybe that would be a better target, who knows? In order to really find this out, uh, we need to learn a bit more about um, what P53, uh, what MDM2 is doing on top of antagonizing P53. Uh, so, in other words, we have to look for additional partners that MDM2 is cooperating with, and that might, for instance, uh, confer this, uh, this uh, support in, uh, in DNA replication. And that's the question that another great student in the lab, Magdalena Winken, has been asking. And um, what she came up with is a few observations. First of all, just phenomenology. So in the absence of uh, P53, MDM2 can 
still, as she found, support the induction of pluripotency in urine embryonic fibroblasts. You know, this kind of, um, you know, induced pluripotent stem cell generation, the Yamanaka protocol, where you provide the cells with a bunch of, uh, of factors, um, the Yamanaka factors, as they are called, and uh, this will induce induced pluripotency in a number of, of differentiated cells. And uh, if you do that, you can do it very nicely on a P53 null cell, this is all the induction of, um, of, pl of pluripotent uh, stem cells. However, if you take out MDM2 from that system, it's getting a lot less efficient, as if MDM2 is supporting stemless or can support stemless induction. And we can do the same thing on mesenchymal stem cells. If we take out MDM2, all of a sudden we can much more easily differentiate them into, into osteoblasts. That's, that's for you <coughs> specifically. Um, the, the, we can differentiate them into osteoblasts. Um, so uh, perhaps arguing that, again, MDM2 is keeping the cells in a stem-like cells, and if you take it out, you can get more differentiation. And if you consider cancer cells at least carrying some of the features of stem cells, it may not surprise you that, again, in cancer cells, if we, even if we are, again, in a P53 null or P53 mutant background, if we take out MDM2, we will diminish the proliferation. Uh, this is proliferation assays. We will diminish the proliferation of cells. So the question is, how could it be? How could MDM2, to, even in the complete absence of, uh, of P53, still support stemness and cell proliferation? How could it be? So we did what everyone would doing, uh, be doing if we, we have no clue about what's happening. And uh, so what we did was, uh, was uh, this is uh, deep RNA sequencing to find out different uh, patterns of gene expression. And if you then uh, take this whole bunch of, different, uh, of differentially expressed genes between the P53 null and the P53 MDM2 double null uh, cells, uh, what you come up with by uh, gene set enrichment analysis is cells that uh, is genes that are regulated through a specific chromatin modification. On histone H3, it's the lysine 27 that is trimethylated. That's how these genes are regulated. That's what they have in common. So that takes us to histone modifications as uh, modulators of gene expression. You may know that on nucleosomes, we have these tails sticking out of the, of the histones, and you can modify them in different ways, including methylation. This will regulate gene expression. So in our specific case, this particular, um, uh, this particular modification of lysine 27 with the trimethylation is brought about by uh, the polycomp repressor complex 2, and this is frequently flanked by a monoubiquitination at lysine 119, um, mediated by a, a complex called polycomp repressor complex 1. These are repressive complexes that are there to maintain stemness of the cell. So we are asking if, um, MD, whether MDM2 and EZH2, which is the central component of one of these uh, polycomp repressor complexes, might be cooperating. And indeed, if we just knock them down in parallel and compare the gene expression patterns, we find a lot of overlapping genes. Most of the MDM2 regulated genes are indeed also EZH2 regulated. And uh, so if you ask how that might be working, we tried to go a simple way and just ask, okay, could it be that they stick together? So this is a co amino precipitation. You precipitate MDM2, you bring down EZH2. You would precipitate EZH2 and you bring down uh, MDM2. So yes, indeed, they bind to each other. And they not only bind, but uh, indeed they bind on chromatin because we can also perform a chromatin immunoprecipitation using antibodies to MDM2, and we enrich the DNA of these, uh, of these uh, EZH2 responsive promoters. And if we now take out EZH2 by SI RNA, um, what we see is that these uh, amounts of DNA that we are chipping is reduced, indicating that MDM2 is binding to this kind of chromatin through EZH2, through the um, uh, polycomp repressor complexes. So that took us to the hypothesis that MDM2 might be cooperating with the polycomp repressor complexes to modulate their activities. And we addressed that by a chip analysis. This is global chip on, the, on a genomic scale. So uh, just precipitating, in this case, we, we did the, um, the monoubiquitination at, at histone H2A. And uh, what you see here, you can just watch the global pattern. That's good enough. Um, what you see is that as soon as you take out MDM2, 
you will change the pattern. And that's global pattern. Each line is a gene, okay? So, um, so you change the global pattern of H2A monoubiquitination. If you now collapse all these lines, you come up with this diagram. So you see it's a massive reduction. Huh? So if, that's, uh, if, if, if you take that, then the, the conclusion is that MDM2, independent of P53, not only supports stemness, but it binds to polycomb repressors on chromatin, and it will support histone modifications, like in this cartoon, MDM2, mediating the monoubiquitination on H2A. So, what I told you so far, that on the one hand, P53 enhances a DNA replication for progression, at least in part, through MDM2, and on the other hand, I told you that MDM2 acts as a chromatin modifier. So, could the two phenomena be connected? Could it be that MDM2 um, will support DNA replication through chromatin modification? Now, to find out that, on the last slide, I show you that this MDM, um, that we can actually mimic the effect of an MDM2 knockdown on replication by an easy H2 knockdown. So this is shown here. If now rather than taking out MDM2, we just take out a portion of the polycomp repressor complex, what we see is, this is a pharmacological inhibitor, this is an NSI RNA, but it doesn't really matter. In each case, again, we will see a loss in DNA replication processivity if either inhibiting EZH2, the polycomp repressor complex catalytic component, or when knocking down EZH2. So we can mimic the effect that we see with uh, taking out MDM2. And that takes us at least to the speculation that chromatin modification by MDM2 is required for efficient DNA replication. So we think, based on these data, it's worth further exploring the idea that we might still consider MDM2 a good target for drugs, but maybe we shouldn't go for the P53 binding site, but rather for different sites like the, the ubiquitin ligase activity. So that's the bottom line to, to pharma industry. And uh, so I leave it with that. Just thank the people who did the work. This is the chromatin work, and then this is the DNA replication work, the teams for both. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.